Hi everyone, I'm Craig and this channel is Grow Paradise, a community where we help each other grow these weird and wonderful tropical or exotic style plants. And today we are at Abbotsbury Subtropical Gardens on Dorset's Jurassic Coast. And I wanna do a video tour of some of the palm trees growing in the gardens. It's something that you have been asking me for, so let's make it happen. Now, I don't know enough about palms, so we're gonna to need to find David, the garden's curator, and perhaps he'll show us through some of the palms growing in the garden. We'll touch on the best palms for cold climates, uh, some of the faster growing palms, some that have been growing in the gardens for hundreds of years, as well as one or two that are new additions. So, Hopefully you'll find this video useful if you're looking to grow palms or you already grow them and you want to add something a bit rare. Let's go find David. So I found the palms. I'm hoping David's in here somewhere. There he is doing a bit of weeding. Hi, David. Oh, hi, Craig. So hi, Craig. you're going to show us around some of the palms today. This one is a real beauty. Which one's this? So this is Butea capitata. Some might know as Butea odorata. Okay seems to change between the two every five minutes. <laughs> and this is quite a wonderful hardy, or half hardy palm, majoritively. And it originates from high altitude areas of Brazil and Uruguay, which gives it hardiness down to about minus 10, reportedly. Okay, that's fairly hardy for something that looks this, this good. Yes, yeah, so I've, seen records of these growing really quite well across most of southern Britain and well southern England especially and London they're starting to do really well in London and there are some specimens of these that are I mean they're even dwarfing the the really big specimens of these that we have over by the tea house cafe yeah because this is the, the probably the smaller one of the specimens that okay we have. so the but we're others... filming here because the public will be yeah a bit too well i mean for most of us this is still going to be 10 times the size of what we've got in in our garden so i'm impressed already don't worry <laughs> wonderful so this is in a drier situation than those ones over there because this is on our arid bank and it's growing a bit more stout it's a bit more compact and uh but it's it's also got slightly more glaucous foliage it has got a really nice silvery sheen to the leaves. Which is in general the one of the biggest ornamental merits of this plant is its glaucous foliage. Because there, there aren't really many hardy palms that have a, a blue foliage type and that's because it comes from high altitude parts of South America where it gets a lot of sunlight. And this is a plant adaptation to reflect a lot of those harmful UV rays away okay. rather than taking them all in. That's a really good point. So a lot of us that grow plants will notice that arid loving plants, sun loving plants do have that silvery, silvery coloration. So now I understand what that's for. Thank mm. you. And alpines as well, because it's, it's largely about UV rather than necessarily heat. So if it's got loads of UV like they will and saxifrages at the top of mountains at 4,000 meters in the Alps. Yeah they need to have a way of of being able to reflect a lot of that harmful uv defending themselves yeah and everyone thinks plants need sunlight to grow but they don't need too much yes. and no. they've evolved to adapt yes yep indeed so this plant will grow into quite a monster actually and there are specimens of these on on the silly isles that are absolutely colossal and they've been there for hundreds of years so hopefully one day we'll be seeing towering palms here or or around the around England like they are on the cities yeah I think it's inevitable I've seen a lot of people planting these beauty in in their gardens and they're all roughly the same size because I'm guessing they came into cultivation in this part of the world at roughly the same time so we're gonna see like you say them all reaching tree size proportions kind of around the same time. I can't wait, I mm. can't wait. It's gonna be really, really beautiful. Yes, it's very exciting. The other thing that's worth mentioning on this one is are these, which I think are really interesting. So when this flowers, and it has quite, quite wonderful flowers, giant, great inflorescences. This is what 
is what covers it. This is, this is its protecting sheath. Okay. And then, I've, I've well, it's not the greatest particular example of one. The, the bigger specimens can, can be that long. Yeah. And they will get bigger as the, as the plant gets older. But then these, these, I'm thinking of using that as sort of sticking your tapas in or something. Yeah, or a gravy boat. Yeah, great, there you go, there you go. There's, you can definitely eat something out of that. Yeah, no, they're nice. I think you could definitely kind of varnish it and turn it into some sort of ornament in a tropical style garden, like clad your outside bar or, or your garden structures with that and it's gonna make it look like some sort of jungle hut. Mm. Yeah, it's a really nice feature. Yeah, they're really useful things and it's, it's quite, Quite a unique aspect. You don't really get this on an, uh, many other palms that we grow. So, right next to the Butia is another interesting palm. And this is the Canary Island date palm, Phoenix canariensis. I don't really know if it produces dates of any culinary worth. In fact, I've certainly never seen it do anything like that. But it's called the date palm because the, the dates that we all eat from the shop come from the close relative. Okay. Uh, Phoenix dactylifera. And this is a plant that's much hardier than the typical date palm. And that's because it comes from high altitude areas of the Canary Islands. In fact, I was looking at this plant in the wild less than a week or so ago. And it, it does form quite a magnificent palm. It will just keep going up. It will form a really nice trunk and become, <laughs> become a bit of a beast, actually. I've seen some crazy planting of this palm within a couple of feet of houses because people don't quite know how big they're going to get. Yes, you see it trimmed all, like flat all the way down one side. It's such a shame, it's such a shame. Let, let me tell you, give it lots of space. <laughs> <laughs> It is a monster, and you can see how much of a monster it is. These, these stems are, these leaves are very, very long. I'm guessing with this, because I see uh, this plant in particular is for sale quite often in garden centres at a smaller size, and people lose them through winter. Is this the same as most plants, that the bigger it gets, the more cold tolerant it becomes? Yes, yeah. So these do get more cold tolerant, they get bigger. They... <sighs> The, the, the initial problem is they are quite cold sensitive and I think their cultivation potential will probably restrict it, be restricted to the very south of England, okay. I would say. Certainly the southwest does, does best. And urban areas because, um, and urban areas. like you say, they're planted so close to houses. London is the area where that is so often the case. Yes, yeah, there are some wonderful specimens in London of this palm, but <laughs> so often the house is such a shame because one day someone will have enough of them and they'll be chopped down probably. Yeah. And of course, because it's not a tree, I don't think they get tree preservation orders in the same way as other trees do, which is a bit of a shame. But if you can give it the space and you have the climate and you have the sunlight and you have the drainage, it could be a wonderful plant and it just, grows and grows and grows at a very fast rate for, for a hardy palm, hardy-ish palm. And it just, it, well, it contributes something that um, not many of us do. No, and it's a really nice pairing with the Butia. You can see the similar form, but the different colors between the two. It really kind of showcases the differences there. But yeah, both are definitely worth, worth trying. Um, and one maybe with a little bit more protection if you're somewhere that's a bit colder. Mm. Yes, so they, they take quite a while before they start doing this, but our, our one's just starting to push out a flower stem. Okay. And those flowers, well, the ones I saw out in Tenerife were really quite spectacular. Huge, great inflorescences. This kind of bright yellow, orangey color. And I haven't seen them qu quite do that well in, in a British climate, so maybe it's heat related. But nonetheless, it's still an ornamental aspect and to yeah. think of palm trees flowering is, is quite a kind of alien concept to us. Yeah, right. that's very, very true. A nice addition. Yes. So growing in an equally sunny and dry spot is this palm, which is the dwarf 
European fan palm. So the European fan palm, Chamaerops humilis, grows all around the garden and is quite renowned across the British Isles for being very tolerant of a lot of different conditions and in particular cold, which leads many people to think or consider quite widely that it is probably the most cold hardy palm. In fact, I've seen it growing at high altitudes, regions of Spain that can experience quite cold conditions in the winter. This particular plant is the variety Serifera, which comes from the Atlas Mountains in Morocco. And even though it's slightly lower down towards the equator, it grows up to about 1700 meters above sea level. So it does experience quite a lot of cold still. And the real advantage of this variety are two things mainly. First of all, it doesn't grow as big as the typical European fan palm, which although that's much smaller in general than say for example a trachycarpus, which we might look at in a second, it can, it can get quite big and it can turn into a bit of a beast. Whereas this is really quite compact, so if you've got a very small garden but you want to try and pack loads of stuff in, this could be a better choice. And the other thing that's really good about this is this glaucous leaf formation. And when these leaves come out, they are covered in this kind of glaucous covering, which does come off if you scrape it, but it's, it's really gorgeous. It makes it feel a bit more tropical and, and exotic and especially arid. And it uh, just generally makes it a little bit more ornamental, whereas I think the typical European fan palm so uh, just a bit sort of yeah sometimes it, it's one for those of us that like something a little bit different to what many others may be growing it's definitely one to try does this branch out quite as much as the other camerops humilis yes so it, it does form that multi it, it wants to form that multi-stem yeah. stemmed shrub which you can see at the base it's trying to push out these suckers what we do is we pick certain plants to behave as multi-stemmed palms and then we pick some to stay as single stemmed. Okay, just to showcase the trunk and the, the form or a slightly different form. Yes, and often it will depend on where it is, what's around it. It's very contextual as to what we want to have in that space. Say for example, in the, the avenue that we have at the European fan palm, we want them all to be single stem trunks because we want it to lead us round in a very formal way. Whereas somewhere like on the med bank, we might have several stems coming out. But what's really quite important is once you've picked those several stems or whether you want one stem or, or a few, you do need to stay on top of the suckers because it will continue to push out suckers from the base. Okay. Until you basically just have a giant great mass of green and you will never see the trunk if you're not on top of it. Okay, that's a really good tip because that trunk really does add to that exotic feel and the look of the palm, I think. I think they look much better when you can see some of that fibrous trunk material. So I said with the European fan palm that many people consider it to be the hardiest palm for UK cultivation. There's quite a lot of debate around that because there are several palms of potentially similar hardiness. And many people would swear by this actually being the most hardy of the palms we can grow. And this is Jubea chilensis, which comes from Chile, quite high altitude areas of Chile where it does get really cold. And uh, because of that, it's renowned for being potentially hardy down to sort of minus 15. I've heard some reports even saying minus 20. Okay, that's, that's quite a low for a palm. Yes. Yep, and I've, I've seen them growing in Yorkshire. I've seen them growing way up the country. So this is a really good one to try. Only problem is they are incredibly slow and hence incredibly expensive. So it, it really is kind of, you're, you're planting it maybe for your great grandchildren. Yeah. Uh, 
nonetheless, it's worth planting because when they are mature specimens, they are something to behold. So up until now, the vast majority of the palms we've looked at have been growing in very sunny, arid conditions. But we've got a palm here that is really proving to be quite comfortable in a slightly more shady aspect. It's still got dry soil underneath it and very good drainage, which is quite important for palms. But this is, I mean, it might even be outdoing the mule palm in my, in my book, because this is Brachia brandegehii from Mexico. And it just has the most ridiculously gorgeous leaves. And even when the light comes through it, it's just absolutely captivating. It's really nice. There's a, um, a tropical palm, I think called Licuala or something like that, that's got leaves that are kind of perfectly palm shaped, but they're connected all the way down and it gives it a really nice rigid round leaf. This reminds me of that quite a lot. Yes, it's a, it's a really good point. Licuala, I've sort of seen it in the wild and it's, it's just got the most amazing tropical effect. I guess this is probably the closest thing we can get to in a, in a hardy environment. How fast growing is this? Do you know? Well, this plant was put in in 2004. So it's not, it's that, that, I, don't, I really don't think that's that bad for this size plant. Mm. It's 20 years old. So yeah, well, <laughs> not that fast, but it has taken off in recent years. So I think what we, what we tend to see quite a lot with palms is they can take 10, 15 years to even get established in the soil, especially when we're buying them in as quite big pots. So they take all that time to put out their root system to really kind of get established. And then when they are, when they are really going, when they've got the conditions right, when they're fully established, they can then start taking off and they'll go maybe even three or four inches a year in growth. Okay, well, but even if height-wise it's slow, for the size of the leaves, um, if it's just pushing out one or two of these a year, I'd be very, very happy. Well, this, this plant is actually really gorgeous at this height because it means people can appreciate just how colossal that leaf is. Mm. Uh, I'm worried that one day it will be so high that we won't be able to see it and I'll kind of have to point people up with binoculars yeah. or something up, up above us because this does turn into a giant and it's one that you see growing in America, like California, really hot parts of America. And so it's clearly very, very drought tolerant. It's clearly very heat tolerant, but it does perfectly fine here in Dorset where it doesn't get above 25 degrees normally, maybe, maybe 30 if we're, if we're really hot. But this is a plant that I, I don't know that there are any others in the UK. So it is, as far as I'm aware, it is unique. Okay. And it was probably put here as a, a trial and must have had no idea of its hardiness. It's not really been trialed in a cold environment. It's, I, I've seen no records of it growing in cold temperate gardens. And I mean, it's, it's actually baffling that it, it does quite as well here. Whereas things like even Washingtonias struggle in this garden because it's mm. just a bit too cold and a bit too wet. Plants do this sometimes, don't they? You can try your absolute best to get something to survive and it just won't work. Whereas another plant that you could put in and forget about just seems to absolutely thrive. And I'm guessing it's, it's to do with the soil conditions, the microclimate, um, like you were saying with the jubea, just creating the right environment will kind of improve its chances of, of thriving in a climate and a part of the world that it doesn't actually originate from. Yes, so it's really quite a, quite a difficult thing to give plants the right conditions when you're dealing with incredibly specialist plants that aren't tolerant of a massive range of conditions. And the best thing you can do to achieve that is to look at how it grows in the wild. And the better you can understand 
those very unique conditions, whether that's the soil, temperature, light, even things like when the water runs through the soil and how much it rains at different times of year. You can start to piece together those clues into a garden setting. Yeah. And sometimes you might have to use creative solutions to make sure that a plant doesn't dry out too much by giving it a mulch or, or um, making sure it's positioned in a place that doesn't drain off too much. Yeah, and I guess if you're feeding and fertilizing palms, um, learning kind of what soil temperature range that they're actively growing in and when they're really not able to uptake any, any feed that you might put down. So you can pick and choose the right times to feed so you're not wasting your money or, or damaging the plant really by applying too much feed. Yes, yes, and, and feed is a kind of whole topic of debate in itself. Yes. And I, none of these palms have ever been fed okay. that are in the ground. So these are all growing very happily in the soil conditions that they have. And if, even if this did show signs of a deficiency, I would probably just be applying a bit of a leaf mold over the top as a mulch, okay. rather than going too heavy on artificial feed. Because what you can get, sometimes that plant will actually grow too fast. It will make it more susceptible to cold, to the frost, and you can undo all your hard work by trying to get it to grow a bit too fast. Okay, that's a very good point. The most recent addition of the palms that we've looked at today is this one, the Butia Ariospatha, which comes from high altitude areas of Brazil, where it grows in quite sunny conditions. And we've replicated that here, where it does get quite a lot of sun, it's a rarity for Abbotsbury. But we've, we've chosen to plant this one in the lawn, which is uh, quite a, it's a nod to our Victorian heritage when a lot of the sort of highly prized and new, new to cultivation plants, including many palms, were all planted in very formal tree circles in lawns, often in straight rows. The relics of which can be seen actually in, in palms like the ones in the sunken lawn, which are in a straight line. And there are some wonderful old photos of when those palms were about yay high. But this plant, even though it's quite new, still, still getting established, it hasn't really put on a huge amount of growth since it was planted. And that just shows that palms, palms can take a bit of time to get, to get used to the environment that you put them in. But this one is renowned for being both more cold hardy than Beautia capitata and faster growing. And this is all very much with the caveat that it is reportedly this. Yeah. Because <laughs> it hasn't been that widely trialed and I don't know of too many mature specimens of this that are around. But it certainly has potential to be quite a splendid plant with perhaps a, a somewhat similar habit to Beautia capitata but it looks like it, it's showing the promise of having slightly shorter leaves, which will be good. It will make it slightly more compact in this space. We don't want it coming out too far because then people can enjoy that plant in a fairly compact area. So to continue our debate on the hardiest palm for UK cultivation is our next contestant in the... Uh, Trachycarpus fortunii, which comes from most of Eastern Asia, it's quite, quite widespread as a species. And it was originally brought back in the 18th century by Robert Fortune, for whom it's named after. And this is a plant that can grow incredibly tall. We've got some tall ones above us, actually. I've tried to pick a, a small one so we can get an idea of the leaves. And it's got a very hairy husk that, I mean, to my eyes, it doesn't look quite as tropically or exotic as some of, the, some of the ones we've looked at today. But it does create a quite nice effect and it is really hardy. I've seen these growing at fairly high altitudes in the Cotswolds, 
where it gets down to minus 15 fairly regularly. And actually the plant at Hidcut is, it's taller than this plant here. So they, they can reach significant proportions, even in cold gardens. Okay. All the way up the country. But here they are incredibly happy and they grow for most of the year. And some of our plants are absolutely colossal, like the ones over there. And they're, they're so happy here actually that they just seed everywhere. And we have a, a carpet of seedlings that emerge through the year. And we seem to spend half our time trying to pull them out. Uh, although they germinate readily, I imagine they're quite slow from the seeds um, to actually push out these palm leaves, much like most palms. Yeah, yeah, they, they, are, they are really slow. Yeah, okay. And, but we've got, I mean, we've got about a couple of hundred years of succession going on. So okay. We don't have to worry about them too much. They, yeah. They sort, sort themselves out. We've got, <laughs> this is quite a young one for us. The one next to it's probably about, well, over a hundred years old. And then next to that, we've got a little seedling that's decided to pop out down the bottom. It may look like that's a sucker, but they don't do that. That's the, the one great advantage of this over the European fan palm is that it is truly single stemmed. The other great thing about this plant is it's quite shade tolerant. And in fact, we're still yet to find a position that has too much shade for this plant. It, okay. will, it will really deal with wooded conditions. And then the other thing it does is it will remain straight even if you plant four or five within a foot of each other. They never, they never really reach DVD. out to the light, so they always maintain that linear structure, which is really important because if you're trying to get a uniform linear kind of design appeal, which is quite important in the garden, then this will achieve that even if it's shady or next to a house or you've got a neighbor's tree that you think might cause it to grow out in a weird direction. Okay, that's really good to know. So anyone that's looking to create an exotic garden in a shady spot, Trachycarpus fortunii is the one to use. Yes, yes. So if you're not too fond of that hairy husk and you're looking for something a little bit more smooth and tropical looking, like, like you do see in these exotic countries, then there is always the option that you can cut the husks off very carefully. And I've seen this done to amazing effect, especially in the exotic garden at Wisley, where it creates a palm that looks almost like Joanne australis, which some real plant nerds might, might be aware of as a very rare palm that's very hard to grow but it's beautiful and smooth trunked and looks incredibly exotic. So you can achieve that effect with a Trachycarpus fortunii. It is quite labor intensive and we certainly don't have the time to do it with all the many hundreds of trachies that we have here. But there is always that option. And the other thing that's worth mentioning with this plant is that we've, we've actually used this husk to grow epiphytes and this is something we do all around the garden, many different places. This particular plant that's growing as an epiphyte is Bilbergia windii, which is a hybrid which has quite a lot of vigour and it bulks out quickly and it flowers beautifully. And our hope here is that it will create these wonderful great clumps of Bilbergia that will soften that husk add loads of green, add loads of colour, and basically fill out this area with as many plants as we can possibly fit. That's always something I'm aiming for. I want to have a plant in every hole that it could possibly grow in. Yeah, it's a really nice suggestion. And I mean, that husk is almost pre-made with pockets for planting. So it's a really good use of the trunk of Trachycarpus. I like that idea a lot. Yes, yes, so I basically just get my hand in and pull away this great big old husk and it's just a ready-made pot. It's like, well, and probably a certain pot company that's, that's basically the same thing. And of course, coir is, comes from palms originally. It's all very much a similar product. 
so it, it is just the perfect environment. It allows it to drain well, but it can retain that compost. I, I do normally put a leaf mold in with the epiphytes and it just creates this wonderful environment. With some of these, I've actually used another husk off of a different trachycarpus and this will be the trachycarpus we're looking at next. And what I've done is I've wrapped the epiphyte and then stuffed it into the, these holes that are left. Yeah, no, it looks really good. Okay, let's go and have a look at this other trachycarpus. Yes. So, this is the one that's, well, really impressive. Out of all the trachycarpus we have here, and we have quite a few species, this is my favorite. And it's Martianus, which comes from the northeast part of the Himalayas, in particular Nepal, where it grows up to about 2,700 meters above sea level. Okay, so quite cold tolerant? Yes, yes, so, so in theory, yes, quite cold tolerant. Not really sure how much it compares to things like Fortunii. I don't think it's been that extensively trialed. And it is quite a slow plant, but um, yeah, maybe it's worth trying if you can get hold of it. Yeah, I really like the uh, trunk. It's not like the trachycarpus we were just looking at. Yes, yes. So this, this is quite a good example because this is, well, more or less what a Fortunii looks like when it's been stripped. But quite importantly, this is self-stripping. So these bits of husk just peel off. And these were actually what I was using to grow the Bilbergia in. Oh, that's handy. On the last trackie that we were looking at. So all very sustainable. Yeah. <laughs> so I basically just turned this into a little, a little ice cream cone. Uh, the most delightful of ice creams. And then I fill it with compost, stick a plant in there and stick it in the hole Perfect. made in the husk. Ready to go. Fully trachycarpus E. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this has that wonderful smooth stem. And if I wanted to, I could go up a ladder and quickly pull this off and it would be smooth all the way up. The other great benefit to this plant are the leaves, which I have one here ready that I prepared earlier. Very blue, Peter. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, in fact, we, we just did a bit of pruning to make it look a bit better because we are ri literally right in the middle of a bed that nobody ever goes into. <laughs> For some reason, <laughs> the best palm in the garden's over here. So uh, we did a bit of pruning to make it look a bit better. And this one happened to come off at the time. And just look at that for a tracky. That is enormous and really unusual shape to the leaf. Yes, so it's, it's got this quite weird segment that's, that's missing, which really does differentiate it from a lot of the other trachycarpus we have. And that is quite a bit bigger than any of the Fortunii's we have, any of the Wagnerianus that we have. It's, it's just generally got a really nice peel to it. And quite a glaucous underleaf as well. Yeah, I hadn't noticed that until you were turning the leaf around then, the way it catches the sun. It's definitely, I think, probably the top palm on my list for this video so far. I say that now, you wait till I start shopping. <laughs> my list will just keep growing. Yes, yes. Well, because it's got that glaucous effect, you kind of look up into the canopy and the light catches it in a multitude of different ways. So it really is quite a dynamic plant. And I mean, it's right next to a Fortunii, just to kind of give a comparison. It, it's definitely the better plant of the two. Yeah, it's, it's got really kind of rigid leaf stems um, that are kind of stout and a lot chunkier looking. Um, and I think where kind of the split leaf stays intact a lot further out to the edge, just like the, um, Rahia, was it, that we were looking at earlier that yeah. had it, yeah. I think that, that really adds to that tropical look. To me, it almost reminds me of a sabal. Yes. So you get, I mean, very, very tropical plants, this one, but sabal mexicana, which have the most ridiculously sized leaves. They are like completely colossal, but they're, they're this palmate leaf structure and they spread meters and meters. 
but they have this wonderful glaucous color and a similar structure to this. So it's, it's like a little sabol yeah. in, in a lot of ways. I really like it. And the combination of the leaves, the cold hardiness, and the fact that that trunk self strips kind of the husk away. It's, um, this is one I'd like to see a lot more people growing in the UK. It's a real stunner. Well, thank you, David, for showing us around some of the palms growing in Abbotsbury. This is just kind of the tip of the iceberg. There's quite a lot more for visitors to see, isn't there, if they visit the gardens? Yes, it's safe to say, even if you had a season ticket and you came every week, it'd probably take you a good few years to get through all the weird palms we have hidden away. Hopefully you found that video useful. I certainly found it interesting. I didn't realize that there was such a range of palms that we can grow in parts of the world with colder climates. So that's fantastic. Now there were some there that I would love to add to my garden, perhaps a future garden when I have a bit more space. Palms are just great. They're evergreen, you get height, you get all the different textures of the leaves and of the trunk. And in some, as we saw, you get flowers. Now, if there is another group of plants that you would love to see a focused video all about from Abbotsbury Subtropical Gardens, let me know and I'll see if I can make it happen. And if you love growing these plants, don't forget we've got a free online forum. It's a global forum of growers who love growing plants just like you. You can sign up at growparadise.social. And of course, if you're in the UK, feel free to check out the Grow Paradise plant and seed shop. I really, really do appreciate the support. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you all in the next one. Thank you.